you haven't been with us the last several weeks, we are currently in the midst of one of the most famous discourses ever given by a religious leader. This discourse is known as the Sermon on the Mount. In response to the crowds, the massive crowds that were coming into the Galilee, to be healed by Jesus, he ascends one of the many hills that surrounded the Sea of Galilee in order to address his disciples. So the context is that he sees the hurting multitudes, he goes up on a hill to speak to his disciples. Now as we transition this morning away from the Beatitudes and Jesus' treatise on his disciples being the salt of the earth and the light of the world in light of these various character traits, I'm going to evolve our approach ever so slightly in order to kind of pick up the pace. I have two goals moving forward through the Sermon on the Mount. Goal number one will be to work systematically through the text so that you understand what Jesus is actually saying. That's the first goal. If we get through the Sermon on the Mount and you actually understand what Jesus was saying, I've accomplished it. Goal number two will be to then focus on kind of explaining the implications of what Jesus said and the relevant application to our lives. So I want you to understand the text and then begin to grapple with the application. So let's dive into the text. We're going to pick up the pace. Verse 17, we're there because we finished with verse 16 last Sunday. Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. It's it's worth pointing out that the things that Jesus was teaching in this sermon were so revisionist that in the day in which Jesus was saying these things, there was a common reaction amongst the multitudes, amongst the crowds, that Jesus was somehow trying to go beyond the law. So that he was trying to go beyond the prophets. This was a genuine concern in the day. So much so that Jesus here in the sermon feels compelled to address this publicly. He says, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. Why do I tell you not to think that? Because people were thinking that in the time that Jesus was ministering. Continuing, he says, I did not come to destroy. That word destroy, it means to overthrow or to dissolve. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I love the word fulfill. It means in the Greek to fill to the full. It's to render complete. Jesus adds, for assuredly, I say to you. Now, we should pause for a moment because we will see moving forward how Jesus uses this phrase frequently throughout the rest of his sermon. For assuredly, I say to you. And let me explain what makes that really radical. In the Old Testament. So, I mean, we have generations upon generations, hundreds of years of God speaking through people, right? The prophets. But what was the typical refrain? What would they say? The prophets would stand up, again, anointed, commissioned by God, but they would say, thus saith the Lord, and then they would bring the message from God. Jesus breaks from that tradition. He breaks from this norm, and he does something radical. Instead of, thus saith the Lord, Jesus has the boldness, the the surety to say, assuredly, I say to you, rendering his word on par with thus saith the Lord. Jesus uniquely spoke with an, an absolute certainty, a complete authority. I say to you, to heaven and earth pass away. This was a future event that will be fulfilled in Revelation 21. So heaven and earth pass away, one jot, or one tittle. Now, if you're not familiar with the jot or the tittle, these were the smallest punctuation marks within the Hebrew language. Hebrew kind of originated, or at least it developed within their time in Egypt. Thus, there was kind of a, a calligraphy element to the Hebrew language in the way that they wrote it, the way that the letters were structured. And so they had. Uh, these jots, these tittles, these little punctuation marks. So Jesus is saying, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or till the smallest punctuation in the word of God will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Broadly speaking, Jesus here, he's, he's confirming the absolute, the eternal nature of God's word, and he's doing it within the context of the temporariness of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth will pass away, guys, but God's word will stand eternal. And a rather lengthy discussion about the law and how God never really intended for mankind to live up to the holy standard. 
I say that because, you know, the law, it necessitated, you know, God gives all these commands. I want you to do all these things. And the one immediately follows. He's like, and now here's a sacrificial system for you to go and make atonement when you undoubtedly fail. Like, you had a sacrificial system built into the law because God knew you'd never live up to the law, and thus you would need a sacrifice. You would need atonement. You would have a constant and continual failures that every year would necessitate you going to the temple. But in this discussion, Paul, in Galatians 3, verse 24, he gets to the fundamental, the core purpose behind the commandments themselves. He writes, he says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. And then he says, for what reason? That we might be justified by faith. In his infinite wisdom, following their deliverance from Egypt and commissioned to be his holy people, God gave the Hebrews the law in order to be a constant reminder of two very important realities. One, they could never live up to his ideal. That was the first purpose of the law. You're going to fail. You're not good enough. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Purpose number one. I can't do this. Which leads to the second purpose. If I can't do this, if I can't obey this, if I can't attain a righteousness through my goodness, my works, my obedience, then my right standing before God has to be something, again, I can't earn, has to be something bequeathed, something given, something imparted. That was the purpose of the law. Basically, you're a sinner, in case you have any questions, and therefore, because you can't do anything about it, you need a Savior. The law, our tutor, to bring us to Christ so that we could be justified at a different mechanism, by faith. When Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill, to render it complete, he's saying that he came to fill to the full this ultimate work that the law had been given by God in the original to accomplish in the first place. I've come to fulfill what the law was designed to fulfill. You see, Jesus came to earth in human flesh in order to live a sinless life according to the righteous standard established by the law. And then because he never transgressed the law, Jesus was provably sinless. The law is a standard. Jesus lived according to the standard. He's provably sinless, meaning that the wages of sin, again, death, were not something required of him because he had never sinned. We know he had never sinned because he fulfilled the law. And in this sense, the life of Jesus fulfills all of these things, opening another door. I, I, I noted earlier, but in the Old Testament framework, a substitutionary sacrifice had two distinct functions in the life of, of, a, of a sinner. The death of a sacrifice, first, would provide atonement. That's a fancy word. It's kind of a, a Christianese uh, word, Christian lingo, atonement. Meaning, the sacrifice, by offering it, again, innocent, it satisfied, it atoned for the debt because of death, owed by the sinner. So it died in your place. Secondly, it would then yield, so it provides atonement, but then it yields a righteousness before God. So my sins atone for, meaning I, I'm, I'm good for the moment. Now, the problem is, is this is all temporary. Think of it this way. A sacrifice took a person's sin onto itself and then gave back in return righteousness. Many Bible scholars refer to this incredible transaction as the great exchange. Like understand, it was only on account that Jesus was righteous according to the standard established by the law that he could be our sacrifice, our substitutionary sacrifice. The author of Hebrews aptly points out that the blood of bulls and goats, the Old Testament model, it was insufficient to actually address our core issues. And yet, because Jesus was human, not the blood of animals, but because of Jesus and his humanity, his death, according to the way God structured it all, was able to not just satisfy our debt and in turn impart a righteousness, but could make that permanent and not temporary. 
amazingly, as with the Old Testament system, th- none of this was possible apart from what? Faith. Faith in the fact that God would accept a sacrifice. In Romans 8, verses 1-4, through 4, Paul expounds on this re- reality. He writes, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, which is probably the part of this passage you know, you've heard before. There's no condemnation. But then he explains why. For those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending His own Son, Jesus, and the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, He condemned sin in His flesh that, and note, the righteous requirements of the law might now be fulfilled not in Him, but in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You know, as incredible as all of this was, when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, there was a significant problem that he had to address. The Hebrew people had totally lost sight of God's original purpose for the law. You see, a righteous standard that was to illustrate their need for a Savior had become a religious code by which they were trying very hard to earn a right standing before God. Instead of the law being a description of who God wanted His people to be, the Jews had twisted the law into a list of things they were to obey and do. Because this was the case, over the next several verses of this sermon, Jesus is going to tear down their false moralism. He's going to destroy their unfounded sense of being good according to the law, by taking them not to the letter of the law, but to the heart of God behind the law. In a sense, what Jesus is going to do is he's going to tell this group of people that feel like they're right with God because of their works, well, let's see how good you are. You think you're good because you're obeying the law? Well, let's get to the heart behind the law, and then let's actually see how good you are. Let's see. Verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks... One of the least of these commandments. The word break, it's an interesting word. It it implies something that's much deeper than just disobedience, to disobey a command. It spoke of literally being released from a a bond. It was a word that if you broke your vow, your marriage vow, kind of spoke of a divorce. You're divorcing yourself from something. Jesus is saying whoever unbinds themselves from the requirements, even like the least of the commandments given by God in the law, and teaches men so, continuing, shall be called least in the kingdom. Least meaning smallest in stature, smallest in importance, smallest in rank or authority. But whoever does and teaches them, speaking of the least of the commandments, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The first critical point that Jesus makes to his audience was to stress the importance of not only obeying the more difficult aspects of the law to be righteous, but possessing a strict adherence to even the least of the commandments. It wasn't like, I'm good with the big ones. Jesus is like, you got to be good with the little ones too. Like all of them. The least of the commandments. This idea is echoed in James 2 verse 10. James, the half-brother of Jesus, he says, for whoever shall keep the whole law. You want to keep the whole law? He says, but you stumble in one point. You're guilty of all of it. It's true that you sin because you're a sinner and not the other way around. The question you should ask is how many sins must you commit to be considered sinful? Like how many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? Or how many times do you have to cheat on your spouse to be a cheater? How many people do you have to kill before you're considered a murderer? Saying it a different way, how many licks does it take to get to the center of our sin nature? One, a two. No, it's just one. Just one. You have to obey the whole law You can't pick and choose if you want to be righteous by the law. Now Jesus drops the hammer, verse 20. He says, for I say to you, again, uh, repeating this, I say to you, 
this is true, this is coming from me, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, for those that are standing on this mountainside listening to this sermon, what Jesus just said here was so gnarly, it would have been a a mind melt. Like, what? Like, I can't even comprehend what it is that you're telling me. You see, from their perspective, there was no one more righteous than the religious people. I mean, they did religion for a living. I mean, if you're not good, who's good? Like, you're supposed to be the righteous people. Like, if they couldn't be good enough, people are standing there thinking, well, then can anyone be good enough? I certainly can't. Now, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but that is the reaction you're supposed to have upon reading this. And if, and if, you, if you miss it here, you'll get, you'll get it hammered home even further by the end of the chapter. You see, at the end of the chapter, Jesus kind of sums up his fundamental point. Verse 48, again, we're not going to get too far ahead of ourselves, but this is the whole idea. He says, therefore, or on account of everything I've just said, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, often when we're trying to determine whether or not we're a good person, we do it through self-comparison. We look at the person maybe in the, the, the other table in the sanctuary, and we're like, I, I know I have problems, but that person's life is a train wreck. They're not good, and I'm not dealing with that, which means I'm good. Like It's, it's through self-comparison. I, I know I have issues, but my issues aren't like your issues. So me and God, we're, we're, we're pals. We're playing two-on-two, two, man, me and Jesus. The problem is, is that you're, you're, you're measuring yourself to a false comparison. You're using a broken ruler, a warped tape measure. It's not level. You see, the problem in this culture that Jesus was addressing in ours is that they were looking at the religious leaders, and they had concluded that the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, They were the standard for righteousness. The problem was is that they weren't. Jesus is saying, you want a standard to judge yourself? Look at your Father in heaven. You see, nothing less than total perfection is what God was requiring for a person to be righteous by the law. Now, for those with any delusions at this point, that God would allow them entry into heaven on account of their personal goodness, Jesus, he rocks their world. Verse 21, he says, you've heard it said of old, and he's going to do something here in the the next several sections. He's going to repeat this structure. He's going to quote from the law, you've heard it said of old, and then he's going to segue and transition into explaining the heart of God behind that particular statue. You've heard it said of old, And then he begins, he says, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. That was something that everyone knew. They grew up in Sunday school hearing this command. Command given by God, Mount Sinai in Exodus 20, verse 13, was repeated then 40 years later as the children of Israel are about to make their way into the land of promise in Deuteronomy 5, verse 17. Within the law of God, murder, which was defined. There were seven different words used in the Hebrew language for you know, killing. This word murder, it's premeditated manslaughter. This was a capital punishment. Death is what was required. You shall not murder. But I say to you, so here's Jesus. You've heard it said of old, but I say to you. So he's establishing, he's creating a contrast. He says, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, please understand, being angry with a brother is not in and of itself a wrong thing. Jesus didn't say there wasn't a reason to be angry or that you couldn't be angry with your brother. Like, there are times, actually, that anger towards a brother is probably the most likely and appropriate response. Your brother does something moronic, and you're angry about it. That's okay. What Jesus is referencing, and notice, he says, He says, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause. So your anger is not justifiable. There's no explanation. It's not reasonable. 
Now, this word that's used here for judgment, it's the same Greek word that we found in the previous verse regarding murder. So Jesus is telling his disciples that from God's estimation, being angry with a brother or a sister without cause was on par with the actual act of murder and therefore demanded the same deadly consequence. Jesus is saying here, he's saying, you guys know full well that it is a violation of God's law to murder someone. Don't think we have to debate that. But I say to you that unless you have a cause, being angry with a brother is just as condemnable. He says, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. The word council is literally Sanhedrin, the, the, the ruling body in Jewish society. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Hellfire, by the way, is not a good thing. It's literally the fires of Gehenna. The word raka, you can read all kinds of commentary on this particular word and what it means. Is there really a, an equivalency? I heard one scholar that was like, it's not really a word, it's more of a grunt. It's more of kind of like, it's a sound that's made. The idea uh, it translated as boneheadedness. It's like calling someone a moron, empty-headed. Referring to someone culturally as a fool. It was to assault that person's character, their integrity. Jesus is telling his disciples that even attitudes that lead to anger, which can then manifest into the act of murder, are also included by God in this one simple commandment, thou shalt not murder. You've heard it said, but I say to you that God was addressing more and the command than the action. Amazingly, you were feeling good about your personal righteousness. Jesus is saying, like, you think you're good that you haven't murdered someone. That, that's a good thing. But you also need to know that you'll be held just as responsible for your attitudes and your emotions in addition to your actions. So you feel good about yourself? Now, writing on a related topic in Romans 7, Paul, who himself had been a devout Pharisee, Paul had prided himself in a former life on his ability to obey the law. He explains what changed his thinking, aside from, you know, meeting Jesus. You know, when you're riding on a donkey and you get knocked off that donkey by Jesus himself, that has a tendency to change your outlook. But he says, like, from a theological standpoint, that the one thing that really just blew his mind was the command of God. So you got the top ten, you got the big ten. He says, of the big ten, it was, you shall not covet, that just really challenged his theology and stripped him of his self-righteousness because unlike the other commandments that refer to physical actions, covetousness fundamentally exists where? It's a matter of the heart. Thou shalt not covet. And that one command, God was taking the law beyond the physical and into our hearts. Again, everyone in, in this crowd knew that murder was wrong. It was a violation of God's law. It warranted judgment. And yet Jesus wanted them to know that the holy standard that God was addressing by the commandment went much deeper than your actions. Though attitudes do merit different degrees of punishment, from God's perspective, the roots behind an action, the roots by which actions manifest, anger, contempt, leading to murder, are just as wrong. And damning. Verse 23. Therefore. Anytime you run across a therefore. Ask what is it therefore. So in context. Because of the serious way in which God views our attitudes. Attitudes toward brothers and sisters. He says if you bring your gift. To the altar. So in this scene that Jesus is going to paint for us. You are coming to the temple. To bring an offering to God in worship. So if you're coming to the temple, you're bringing your gift, and you remember that your brother has something against you. Now this phrase, has something against you, it implies that you, it dawns on you, that you're guilty of doing something that has caused a rift. You're the guilty party. So you're coming to make this offering to God, and you remember, man, I really blew it with this person. 
and I'm at fault, I know that, but I really, I've really messed this up. If that's you, Jesus says, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come again to the temple, to the altar and offer your gift. Now, the implications of what Jesus is saying and the practical application for our lives as his disciples is really profound. Like Jesus is telling us that if you have wronged someone, you have wronged a brother, a sister, (laughs) Jesus would rather you not worship and not come and serve until you've gone and taken the necessary steps at reconciliation. I mean, that's heavy, isn't it? There's some of us that, that as we were worshiping the Lord this morning, We should have been out front making a phone call. Now, let me address the idea of reconciliation. Because I I do think that we have the wrong expectations for what results. Restoration, different. You could define as the act of a relationship being returned to the way that it was before it was broken. If you restore a car, an old car, right? car's been weathered, it's been aged, it's got rust, it's, it's in bad, bad shape. If you restore the car, the idea is that what, what, what results? When you're done, it is exactly the way it was when it rolled off the assembly line. You've restored it. In contrast, reconciliation is a bit of a different thing. Reconciliation, it, it's a return to the relationship, but it's a return to the relationship within a new context on account of whatever's transpired. Like for starters, when Jesus says, be reconciled to your brother, he's addressing the guilty party, not the innocent party. He's saying, if you've done something wrong by your brother, it's incumbent on you as the guilty party to do something about it, to act. That said, if you're the person in the wrong, Jesus is also acknowledging that your expectation And your actions shouldn't be restoration, but reconciliation. Like in the end, whatever that relationship ends up looking like, whatever that new normal is, will tend to be determined by the reaction of the offended party. So you should seek reconciliation. For for an illustration, let's say uh, your marriage is on the rocks. And your marriage is on the rocks, Because you have done something stupid, okay? None of you, but other people. (laughs) Restoration is you coming, owning it, and then, like, God doing a miracle, and really coming on the person that was hurt, letting go of their pain, letting go of their resentment, God doing this work, and man, like, our marriage is not just as good as it was, man, it's even better. That can work. Sometimes, let's say you've cheated on your wife or something even worse, and you come back, you can be reconciled, but it might be divorce. Like, so the the marriage is dissolved, but there's a new context. Like, I'm going to seek reconciliation that's incumbent upon me, but I know that, like, restoration's not going to happen. Because there's some pain, there's some hurt you can't get over, and I get that. it's, It's not my right to tell you what to do. But for the sake of kids, we need to be amicable. We're both Christians. We're both believers. We got So reconciliation is, well, there's a new context. <laughs> but I still have to enter this new context. And i got to be willing to do what's necessary to be in this new context. Like if you're in a business relationship and you've been stolen, like someone has stolen money from you, restoration might not be possible. But that's not what God's asking. He's saying reconciliation. It might be the dissolving of the business. But you should seek reconciliation. Jesus continues, he he gives the reason why this is important. Verse 25, he says, agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. And and the word adversary, it's it's a very unique and specific word that referred to the opponent in a lawsuit. So this is the person suing you. The idea of of agreeing with your adversary, it's, it's you're making the commitment. Commit to seeking a remedy with your adversary. And why? He says, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. And this word spoke of a Roman consulate. 
the judge then hand you over to the officer, which was actually in, in the Greek, the under rower. So this was the person in charge of the slaves, the, the person in charge of the prison, and you'd be thrown into prison, which again is unique because there was no prisons in Jewish culture. Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny or satisfied the debt. And you read through this and you're like, well, what is Jesus saying? And again, my first goal is to try to help you understand it. In the law, reconciliation. So we go back to the Hebrew law. Reconciliation was only possible through what was known as the act of restitution. If I harmed you, according to God's law, it was incumbent upon me to do more than simply apologize and own it. I had to be willing to practically do whatever was necessary to make sure you were whole. In these verses, Jesus is pointing out that recompense will always be carried out. If you're at fault, you're going to pay your debt one way or the other. You actually have a choice, though. Like in a literal sense, there's no doubt that Jesus is exhorting his disciples, hey, handle your beefs with one another quickly and do it in-house. You know, it, it is, the Bible speaks about this in other places. Like it is a tarnish on our godly witness when Christians need a secular worldly arbitrator to rectify our differences. Get together, figure it out. Don't include the courts. That said, beyond the legal ramifications, there, there is a deeper lesson I think Jesus is speaking to. You know, when we fail to do what is necessary to reconcile an issue that we have with a brother or sister. So I want you to get real personal for a moment because you've all been guilty of probably hurting someone. So think about You've hurt someone, and you are avoiding the problem. (laughs) Uh, You're resisting admission of guilt. You're unwilling to make restitution. You're refusing to pursue forgiveness. So that's you. You've hurt someone, and you're not doing anything about it. Let me ask, how's it going? Jesus is saying that your recompense is going to happen, But the consequence right now is probably worse than otherwise. Like, have you ever been imprisoned by a bad relationship? Like, because you haven't been been willing to do your part to resolve issues with someone else. You're miserable. That person's always on your mind. The contention is a festering wound. You're being eaten alive by guilt. You see that person at church or in a social setting, and you get anxiety, and you try to run the other way. I say this because I'm guilty of it. You don't want to look them in the eye. You feel real awkward. Like you are imprisoned in a bad relationship because you're not willing to do what's necessary to seek reconciliation. What Jesus is saying here, he said, you can do this the way that the law says to deal with it. If not, you'll go to the courts and the courts will deal with it and you'll end up in prison And you'll make sure that you pay the last penny if you're the guilty party. So, like, you can choose. Like, recompense is going to happen. You decide how you want it to happen. Doing whatever is needed to deal with a problem is so much better than ignoring the problem because it doesn't go away. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. As with the earlier example of murder, this command was originally given by God from Mount Sinai. And Exodus 20, verse 14, again repeated in Deuteronomy 5, 18, Leviticus 20, verse 10, actually tells us that adultery, like murder, was also considered to be a capital offense. While everyone Jesus is speaking to would have agreed that adultery was a violation of God's law, not a good thing, he adds, he says, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman, so, so the, the idea is to see with one's eyes and then to gaze upon with the intention, Jesus says, to lust for her. So you are longing for her in your mind's eye, sexually. You are desiring her with your heart. You are coveting what is forbidden. You've heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her, and Jesus says of this person, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. So you're guilty of the command. I should point out that Jesus is not speaking 
of a sexualized image that you could not avoid seeing with your eye. He's not saying that that makes you guilty. Nor is he addressing kind of an involuntary sexual thought that randomly pops into your head. And I'm relieved at that because we live in a very sensualized culture, meaning we'd all be in very, very big trouble. Instead, Jesus here is describing something that may have at first been accidental or not, but it quickly becomes something deliberate. In this scenario, there's an image, something you've seen, it enters your mind through your eyes, but it results, it manifests in, in, a, in a sinful longing, a desire, something in the heart. A great example of this is, is David and Bathsheba. David seeing her bathing. Should have turned his eyes, but he stood there and he gazed. What was captured in the eyes went into the mind and went down into the heart. He committed unspeakable evils as a result. You know, one thing that separates humanity, there, there are a lot of things, but one of them, that separates humanity from the rest of the animal kingdom is our capacity for imagination. Like the power, ability, to think beyond what's possible or presently actual. It's something you don't find in, in any other capacities within the animal kingdom, but humanity. We have the ability to progress to imagine. That's led to progress, right? In a lot of ways. Te technologically, scientifically, socially, culturally. I should also add that the power of imagination has enabled mankind to digress morally, ethically. But what makes this section of Scripture so interesting and revolutionary, and I should add different, like if Jesus is making this point about murder, why is he now repeating, kind of bringing another illustration? I think he's trying to communicate something different than what he was uh, articulating with murder and anger. What Jesus is saying here is that God will hold people just as responsible for our thoughts and our imaginations as he does our actions. So if at any point you've been feeling really good about yourself, you shouldn't at all now. The law doesn't just speak about actions, it speaks about attitudes. Ugh. But it doesn't speak about attitudes, it just speaks about thoughts and imaginations. You know, no one would argue that cheating on your spouse is, is, is a good thing. In fact, it's a terrible deed. But Jesus is telling his disciples that the process of looking upon another with desire and then the mental scenes that are subsequently allowed to play out in our minds is just as wicked as the deed itself. If the command not to murder includes emotions and attitudes, the command not to commit adultery includes our thoughts, imaginations, and passions, even if you don't act upon them. You know, if you listen to Bible studies on this section of Scripture, this is the point in the message where the application morphs into me providing you some practical tips that will help you guard what you allow your eyes to see in various ways that you can take your thoughts into captivity. Jesus, I think, knew that would be our reaction. So I love what he says next. Verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, literally, if your right eye causes you to stumble or trips you up, pluck it out, cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Cast it from you. I don't know why you need to cast it from you. It's not like it does you any good once it's been cut off. But that's what he says. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish. Basically, it's more like the more advantageous long-term outcome is that a member perishes than for your whole body to be cast into hell. <laughs> oh, the number of sermons you've likely heard preached off of this famous text. And the reason being is the applications for the preacher are endless. Sadly, though, I think what we have here is a perfect example as to why it's very dangerous to cherry-pick passages out of their context, out of the context in which they were given. Case in point, 
I'm, I'm convinced Jesus is not saying at all what most people interpret him to be saying. I'll explain. There is no question that Jesus is making an important point using hyperbolic language. And that what he's articulating should not be taken literally in any way. And most people will agree to this. Two reasons. First, the prospects of the body entering heaven maimed, as opposed to being cast into whole, that is a ludicrous supposition on its surface. Like there's no biblical evidence that that's even a possibility. Secondly, if you carry forth Jesus' suggestion, so you're dealing with sin, pluck out an eye, cut off a hand. If you take that idea, that remedy to sin, to its logical end, you know what? You fail to actually solve the problem. Like, for example, if we're being honest, if you remove your right eye, the problem is that you're left with the left eye to sin with. And then let's say you get drastic and you decide to pluck both eyes out. You're still unable to erase whatever sinful images you've already captured with those eyes that cause you to sin in the first place. So you're, you're just a blind guy trapped to your own sinful imaginations. Like In many ways, this reminds me of the famous scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail that features the black knight who refuses Arthur, king of the Britons, necessary passage. After Arthur abruptly cuts off his left arm, the black knight smugly replies, "'Tis but a scratch." Refusing to see defeat against the king, he proceeds to lose his, his right arm as well. Arthur assumes the fight is over, but he's taken back. Because the black knight starts kicking him, claiming that the loss of his second arm was just a, a flesh wound. At this point, Arthur cuts off a leg. But again, the knight continues to fight by reverting to headbutting. It's only after King Arthur cuts off both legs that the knight finally concedes. Okay, we'll call it a draw. You know, in order to understand what point Jesus is making here, using very clear, dramatic hyperbole. You have to ask yourself two questions. So we want to know what Jesus is saying. Ask yourself two questions. Is Jesus emphasizing the drastic measures that his disciples should be willing to take to keep ourselves from sinning? Is that what he's doing here? Which is, by the way, the common interpretation. Or... In light of the fact that Jesus has just told us that sin is more than a physical action, but is also tied to internal attitudes, emotions, desires, thoughts, and imaginations, is Jesus illustrating to his disciples how useless, ineffective, inconsistent, and ultimately silly the drastic measures taken by religious people are when it comes to dealing with their own sin? Here's another way to think about it. In the context of the overarching purpose for the Sermon on the Mount, and more specifically, the subject matter that Jesus has just unpacked for us. You know, you have to be more righteous than the religious leaders to enter the kingdom of heaven, and your core assumptions about the law and what constitutes obedience are completely incomplete and misguided. Is Jesus giving us, in that context, advice on how we can now deal with our sin, or is he illustrating, again using hyperbolic language, that we really can't do anything about it at all? Like, to this point, I do agree with what most conclude about this section of, of Jesus' dissertation here, that without a doubt, the heart of man's problem is fundamentally a problem of man's heart. It's the big lesson. It's why Jesus has taken us back from murder to emotions and attitudes. It's why from adultery he takes us to thoughts and imaginations. Again, the problem with man's heart is a problem of the heart. Outward actions, there's no question, 
always manifests from internal conditions. Murder is the evidence of an unjustified anger. The, the final act of cheating on a spouse is the result of, of a percolating of sin and imagination in the mind for some time. No one wakes up one day and is like, I'm committing adultery. No, it's the adultery, the affair is the evidence of something that has taken months to get to. You know, when pressed with what to do concerning sin, the religious person always jumps at the chance to present practical remedies. And again, you've heard messages on this passage that do this. Even when it's acknowledged that external actions like murder and adultery are the result of an internal condition, we still want an application. What can we do to fix this, to safeguard against this? You'll hear these messages. Christian brother and sister. In this passage, Jesus is clearly telling us that if we as his disciples would be willing to take drastic, even dramatic steps to deal with our sin, he'll be pleased. Sure, it might be crazy. You might be a wingnut if you cut something off or you pluck out an eye. That's not what Jesus is saying. But you should do something. In fact, here are 12 steps that you can employ to tame that wily anger of yours. Or here's some practical ways that you can safeguard against lusting after that pretty little lady at work. You've heard the Bible studies. But here's the problem with this approach. Legalistic remedies that place the onus on things for me to do or refrain from doing to overcome an outward sin that manifests from my sinful heart never work. And not only that, they only result in self-mutilation and deformity. Rumor has it that even Stephen Hawking couldn't kick his porn addiction. The fact. That was a joke. It'll come to you later. <laughs> Rumor has it that even Stephen Hawking couldn't kick his porn addiction. Here's the truth. The truth. Religious works always fail. And what Jesus is saying is that they leave the person in worse shape than before. In closing, if drastic measures towards sin, if that was the solution, plucking out an eye or cutting off a hand to enter heaven would actually be preferable, wouldn't it? I mean, wouldn't you rather be in heaven without an arm than being in hell with two? I would be. I mean, if, if that's what it takes, but that isn't. Again, the Bible is clear that you can never change an internal condition through an external restraint. And yet, if as the gospel message demands, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart, there is, my friend, a solution. Ask God to transform your heart. Knowing that a change in behavior will always naturally result. 